Some people think the Bible is just a bunch of stories. Entertaining? Yes. Historically accurate? No. Today on the Mini Bible College, you'll study a page of history right out of the book about one of the greatest ancient cities, Nineveh. Sound familiar? Hi, this is Bill Wright, and today we're in a study of the book of Nahum. Let's join Pastor Dick Woodward in our revisit to the town old Jonah said would fall. This is the vision God gave to Nahum concerning the impending doom of Nineveh. God is jealous over those he loves, and that is why he takes vengeance on those who hurt them. He furiously destroys their enemies. He is slow in getting angry, but when aroused, his power is incredible, and he does not easily forgive. The Lord is good. When trouble comes, he is the place to go. He knows everyone who trusts in him, but he sweeps away his enemies with an overwhelming flood. He pursues them all night long. What are you thinking of, Nineveh, to defy the Lord? He will stop you with one blow. He won't need to strike again. O oh, my people, I have punished you enough. Now I will break your chains and release you from the yoke of slavery to this Assyrian king. To the king of Assyria, God says, I have ordered an end to your dynasty. Your sons will never sit upon your throne, and I will destroy your gods and temples, and I will bury you for how you stink with sin. See, the messengers come running down the mountains with the glad news. The invaders have been wiped out, and we are safe. O Judah, proclaim a day of thanksgiving, and worship only the Lord as you have vowed. For this enemy from Nineveh will never come again. He is cut off forever. He will never be seen again. As we continue surveying these prophets, referred to as the later prophets, not in any sense inferior to those that are referred to as the major prophets, we come to the prophecy of Nahum. Now, some have said that a better title for the book of Nahum would be Hoham, because it's very boring to read the book of Nahum. So as we approach our survey of the book of Nahum, I guess the question is, Hoham or Nahum? Now, so that it won't be a Hoham book to you, I would like to first of all set some historical perspective on this prophet Nahum and then see if we can't get at the message of the prophet of Nahum and then especially as we have in all of these prophetic books we want to try to discern the devotional application of the book of Nahum. Now if you get historical perspective on this book you'll realize as you begin to set the scene historically that the book of Nahum takes us back to that city which was the object of Jonah's prejudice and preaching. In 785 B.C., we feel that Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and he preached to the city of Nineveh. And as we saw in surveying the prophet Jonah, the greatest evangelistic crusade on record took place when that little prophet Jonah went into the city of Nineveh and preached his great citywide crusade there in the city of Nineveh. Now, it's about 150 years since Jonah has done that. If you get into ancient history, you discover that about 60 years, or just a little over a generation, after Jonah had his great evangelistic crusade in Nineveh, Nineveh apparently repented of their repentance because it was then, 60 years after the preaching of Jonah, that the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and the capital of Israel, Samaria, fell to them. Now, in the years that passed after that 60-year period when Samaria fell and the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of Israel were taken off into captivity and never heard of again, the Assyrians went about enslaving, conquering with indescribable cruelty and brutality all the peoples of the world of that day. Assyria became the great world power and they were almost unprecedented in their cruelty and their barbarism as they conquered and enslaved people. Now, at this point, 150 years after the preaching of Jonah, 60 years after the fall of the northern kingdom and its capital of Samaria, God gives a vision to this little prophet Nahum. And that vision is that this great city of Nineveh, which was a very great city, it was the queen city of the world of that day, the queen city of all the earth. 
the prophecy and the vision given to Nahum is the city of Nineveh is going to fall. Now, he preaches the vision God gives him, and that vision in three short chapters is simply this. Chapter 1, you could call chapter 1, the doom of Nineveh declared, and you could call chapter 2 in Nahum's prophecy, the doom of Nineveh described, and in very vivid detail, the doom and the fall of Nineveh is described in chapter 2 of Nahum. And then in chapter 3 of Nahum's little prophecy, you have the doom of Nineveh defended. In other words, why would God have this city, this capital city of the Assyrian Empire, fall like it did? Now, in those three chapters, the theme, of course, is the fall or the doom of Nineveh. Now, the reason why this book is in the scripture, first of all, is 23 years after Nahum preached this vision, Nineveh fell. At the time that he preached it, people probably scoffed and thought it was ludicrous to say that a city like Nineveh would fall. The city of Nineveh was built upon two rivers, and the saying used to be that the only way Nineveh could ever fall would be for its river on which it was built to turn against it. Now, in the prophecy of Nahum, he's very specific. He says that's going to happen. The city is going to fall because the river is going to flood. It's going to cause a break in the wall. The enemy is going to come through the break in the wall and completely conquer the city. Now, 23 years later, after Nahum preached this prophecy, that literally happened and it was fulfilled right to the letter. Now, as we get some perspective on this little prophet Nahum, we don't know too much about him. We have a pretty good idea of when he lived because we know when the northern kingdom fell. And he mentions the fall of Thebes, which took place in 663 B.C. We know that Nineveh fell in 607 B.C., and so the scholars date this prophet Nahum right in between those two events or at about 630 B.C. This means that he was a contemporary of the prophets who preceded the Babylonian captivity, like Isaiah, and he lived during the time of good king Hezekiah. There are two possibilities as to where he lived. Elkosh is mentioned, and there is a little place near Nineveh by that name, and some feel that that was his home. They claim that his tomb is there. But in the north of Galilee, there's a city called Capernaum. It was the adopted home of Jesus. Jesus, of course, was from Nazareth, but he marveled at their unbelief when he went to his hometown there in Nazareth. And he adopted Capernaum uh, on the Sea of Galilee as his home. He actually had a home in Capernaum. The Gospel of Mark tells us that. The word got around that Jesus was home in his house. That's where the man was lowered down through the roof. They, they feel that that was a home that Jesus had there in Capernaum. That was his headquarters for the first part of his ministry, which took place up there in Galilee, where he did his recruiting, his discipling, a lot of his teaching, and a lot of his healing before he went down to Jerusalem to suffer and die. Now, the, the name Capernaum actually means, in the original language, village of Nahum. And many people feel that this prophet Nahum was the founder and the namesake for that little town on the Sea of Galilee called Capernaum. Now, of course, the important thing, after we get some historical perspective on the prophet Nahum and especially the events described in his book, which is primarily, of course, the fall of Nineveh, we need to focus our attention upon his message. Now, the first thing to do as you want to focus upon the fall of Nineveh is to get some focus upon the city of Nineveh. You see, the diggings of the archaeologists tell us that this little prophecy of Nahum is not only an awesome prophecy about the fall of a great city. The diggings of the archaeologists tell us that as we read the prophecy of Nahum, we are reading a page out of history. Now, if the prophecy of Nahum fills you with awe, then the fact that it was all fulfilled 23 years after it was preached, that ought to overwhelm you with awe. We said before that as we survey the prophets, we're going to read about the fall of four cities. You've heard of the tale of two cities. Well, this prophetic literature in some senses can be called the fall of four cities. The people of God had a kingdom in the north and a kingdom in the south, ten tribes in the north and two in the south. That northern kingdom had a capital, 
and that capital city was Samaria. Well, these prophetic books will tell us about the fall of Samaria. It fell to the Assyrians, as we said, 60 years after Jonah preached to Nineveh. And then the people of God had a kingdom in the south, the kingdom of Judah, which had a capital, which was Jerusalem. And so much of the prophetic literature focuses upon the fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity, you know, which followed that. Now, the other two cities that fall are the cities of the enemies of the people of God. The Babylonians have a capital city, which is Babylon, of course, and that falls to the Medes and Persians. And you read about that in the book of Daniel. That's mentioned in the prophetic literature. But then the enemy of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, really the worst enemy they ever had was Assyria. Remember that Assyria conquered the northern kingdom, and right after they conquered that northern kingdom, they turned south, and they went down into Judah, and they conquered 46 walled cities. They took 200,000 captives, and they went right up to the gates of Jerusalem, and that's where Isaiah had his shining hour. And because of the miraculous prophetic ministry of Isaiah, they were turned away from the gates of Jerusalem. If it hadn't been for Isaiah, we said, when we surveyed the book of Isaiah, both the northern and the southern kingdom would have fallen to the Assyrians. The Assyrians were their worst enemy. Now, this city, Nineveh, is the capital of Assyria. So it's very significant when you read about the fall of that city because it was the capital of their worst enemy. The word Nahum, or the name Nahum, actually means full of comfort. The very name of this prophet suggests comfort. And the message of Nahum is one of comfort. Now you may ask, how could a doom and gloom, fire and brimstone message like this ever be a message of comfort? Well, think about this for a minute. Suppose you were a Jew living in the 40s, and you knew that Hitler was systematically conquering Europe, and every time he conquered a city, if you were a Jew, you were sent off to Auschwitz or someplace, and you were gassed and burned. And you knew it was just a matter of time as he came across Europe until he got to your town, to your village, and let's suppose you were Jewish. Now, if you heard, as some did, thanks to the Allies back there in the 40s, that Berlin had fallen and the Third Reich was in ashes, wouldn't that be good news? Wouldn't it be good news to you as a Jew to hear that the system that was trying to put you and all of yours to death was conquered, wouldn't that be good news? Well, that's the way it sounded, especially to Judah, that little kingdom in the south, when Nahum preached to Judah the good news that Nineveh was going to fall. Now, there weren't any signs at this time of Nineveh falling, and so it was a prophecy they had to take by faith, but it sure was good news. They sure wanted to believe that. You see, the message that Nahum preached to the people of God was, you don't have to worry about Assyria anymore. They're never coming back to the gates of Jerusalem. They're never going to come and invade your land again. They are doomed. Nineveh is going to fall. And boy, he describes it so graphically there in chapter 2. You can actually visualize it. He describes the color of the enemy army's uniforms, and he describes the sun reflecting on their shields, and he describes it so vividly you can almost hear the shouts and the noises of the battle as he describes the doom and the fall of Nineveh. Well, that was good news to the people in Judah. And it was a message of comfort. And that's why perhaps this prophet's name suggests the idea of comfort. When you get into this first chapter and you hear the declaration that Nineveh is going to fall, the next thing you ought to focus upon perhaps is the city of Nineveh itself. We gave you in your Daniel notes a description of the city of Babylon just to give you some idea of that city in which Daniel had his ministry and which he lived his life. Now listen to this description by a scholar of this city of Nineveh because that will help us to appreciate what Nahum's preaching and what is such comfort to the people of God. At the time of Nahum's prophecy, Nineveh was queen city of all the earth, mighty and brutal beyond imagination, head of a warrior state built on the loot of nations. Limitless wealth from the ends of the earth poured into its coffers. Nahum likens it to a den of ravaging lions feeding on the blood of nations. Greater Nineveh was about 30 miles long and about 10 miles wide. 
It was protected by five walls and three moats built by the forced labor of unnumbered thousands of foreign captives. Jonah's mention of 120,000 babies suggests that it might have had a population of near a million, some say as much as two million. The inner city of Nineveh proper, about three miles long and one and a half miles wide, built at the junction of the Tigris and Kosher rivers, was protected by walls 100 feet high and broad enough at the top to hold four chariots driven abreast eight miles in circuit. That's a big city. At the height of Nineveh's power, on the eve of its sudden overthrow, Nahum appeared with this prophecy called by some Nineveh's death song or a cry of humanity for justice. That gives us perhaps some historical perspective on the city itself. Now, as we've already pointed out, this was good news to the southern kingdom and Nahum directs his message to that southern kingdom, telling them that they don't have to worry anymore about the invasion that they feared, constantly feared, at the hand of the Assyrians. Notice how he will say, Oh, Judah, you don't have to worry about this. The message is directed to Judah. The message to Judah is that they have been set free from the threat of Assyria because of this prophecy. And then his message is directed to the king of Assyria. And he's very blunt, like all these prophets are. He says, God has declared an end to your whole miserable system because you stink with sin. That was very subtle, I think, when he <laughs> put it that way. Now, there are many reasons given by Nahum throughout this book, and especially in chapter 3, for God doing this. What it all comes down to when you get into the reasons for this wrath of God being expressed on Nineveh is that like the nations in the promised land against which the wars of extermination were conducted, these people in Nineveh are indescribably cruel and sinful. The archaeologists affirm their atrocities. Even archaeology can affirm that. When God ordered those wars of extermination against the land of Canaan and all those nations that were in there, remember in Deuteronomy it said because of their unspeakable sin, their sins were like a cup that had gotten full and God couldn't handle any more and so he ordered the wars of extermination. Well, the same thing is true here with Assyria. Here's another quote from a scholar about the brutality and the wickedness and cruelty of Assyrians. Assyrian policy was to deport conquered peoples to other lands, to destroy their sense of nationalism and make them more easily subject. Assyrians were great warriors. Most nations then were robber nations, but Assyrians seemed to have been about the worst of them all. They built their state on the loot of other peoples, and they practiced cruelty. They skinned their prisoners alive, or cut off their hands, feet, noses, or ears, or put out their eyes, or pulled out their tongues, and they made mounds of human skulls, all of this to inspire terror. They were just indescribably cruel. Now, in verses 2 through 8 of the first chapter of Nahum, you begin to pick up a theme in the prophecy of Nahum in addition to the doom and the fall of Nineveh. Really, the prophecy of Nahum is a study of the character of God. The character of God, what is it really? Is God emotional? If God is emotional, is he capable of more than just one emotion? We have a tendency in our culture to fixate upon certain attributes of God, like the love of God. We like that. We like the love of God because, you know, if God is a God of love, we come off pretty well. So we really like that. And when people suggest that that's not the only thing there is to the character of God, we get uncomfortable. We get uncomfortable when we hear about the justice of God and the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and how God will not ultimately tolerate injustice and unrighteousness and sin. We don't like that kind of a God. But the scripture presents to us a God whose emotional makeup is like a rainbow. It's got a lot of different colors, not just one. God is emotional and he's capable of the whole spectrum of emotions, not just love, but other things like, for instance, wrath. But first of all, Nahum pictures God as a father and as a loving father, he is good. He tells us, frankly, God is good. He tells us God is a good place to go when trouble comes and he's a good one to know when trouble comes. And he is a God as a loving father who knows those who know him but that's not the only side to God's character. He tells us, as a just and holy judge, 
God is jealous over those he loves. He takes vengeance upon those who hurt those he loves. He furiously destroys their enemies. His fury or his wrath is like fire. And when he's aroused and expressing his wrath, his power is incredible. And once his wrath reaches this point, he does not easily forgive. Nahum likens the power of God to raging storms like cyclones and earthquakes. In chapter 1, you pick up that theme, and I think that's the message to look for in the prophecy of Nahum. The character of God, what is it? In chapter 2, you have the doom or the fall of Nineveh described, and as we said, he's very vivid in the way he describes it. The queen is stripped naked and paraded in chains into captivity. The soldiers desert. The people are filled with fear and terror. Knees quake, hearts melt in horror. People stand aghast, pale-faced and trembling. That would be true any time a city like that fell. But he describes that all very vividly. And then in chapter 3 of the book, he gives us a reason or a rationale for the doom of Nineveh. In chapter 1, the doom of Nineveh is declared. In chapter 2, it's described. But in chapter 3, it's defended. He tells us why God destroyed Nineveh. He gives reasons like this. Nineveh is a city of blood. Nineveh is full of lies. It's crammed with plunder. She has sold herself to the enemies of God. She's a faithless city, like a beautiful, seductive mistress. She entices nations with her beauty and then teaches them to worship false gods. She's vile. And as we've already pointed out, he said, her king stinks with sin. And the land of the people of God lies broken after your attacks. There he's referring to Judah, which, as we said, lost 200,000 people to Assyria when they invaded Judah, and 46 cities were destroyed. You crushed your enemies to feed your children and your wives. And here is perhaps an important reason for the fall of Nineveh. All who hear your fate will clap their hands for joy, for where can one be found who has not suffered from your cruelty? You could have said that in Europe again in the 40s. Where would you find anybody who hadn't suffered from the Third Reich? If you went out east toward Russia, would you find anybody that hadn't suffered from that system? Well, that's the way it was in the day of the Assyrians. There just wasn't any place where you couldn't find people who hadn't suffered from their cruelty. Now, the big question for us to ask as we look at this story about the doom of Nineveh, declared, described, and defended, is this. Is there any devotional message for you and me? We live 20 centuries beyond the New Testament. Now, does this book have anything to say to us? I think it really does. And the message that this book has for us has to do with this truth that comes through the book about the character of God. It's really a study of the wrath of God, the prophecy of Nahum. The Hebrew word for the wrath of God is a very interesting word. It's the Hebrew word for crossing over, like crossing over the River Jordan. And what it suggests is this. God is a God of love, and God is good. And that's what he prefers to be, and that's the way he prefers to express himself. But it's possible for God, as a holy and just God, to tolerate sin, unrighteousness, injustice, cruelty, like on the part of these Assyrians, to the point that he will cross over in his character from being a loving father to being a just and holy judge, and he will express this crossover in his character by venting his wrath. And once he does that, he doesn't stop until he has completely annihilated that which he is expressing his wrath toward, primarily because, if you look at it this way, he says when he talks about God being good, God loves his love objects. He loves those who know him, his children, his chosen people. And even though he's a loving father and loves those who know him, when somebody starts to destroy those love objects, he can cross over in his character. And when he does, he won't stop expressing his wrath until he has annihilated that which is destroying his love objects. This is, in a sense, a definition for the wrath of God. Think of these definitions for the wrath of God in the sense of this crossing over of God's character. The wrath of God is the permanent, consistent attitude of holiness toward unholiness. The wrath of God is the permanent, consistent attitude of a loving God toward that which is destroying his love objects. The wrath of God is the annihilating reaction of absolute holiness toward unholiness. 
And the wrath of God is the annihilating reaction of a loving God toward that which is destroying his love objects. I'll never forget an experience that demonstrated this for me. A loving father was in a police station, absolutely shattered, because even though he was a loving, gentle father, a very sick man raped and murdered his little seven-year-old daughter. Now, when they brought into the police station the man who had done that to this loving father's love object, it took every policeman in that police station to hold that man down, to keep him from getting at this man who had destroyed his love object. You see, Hitler made this mistake back in the 40s. He looked at America and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek. I believe the Japanese made this mistake too. Americans are just, you know, good-natured, nice people that want to live in peace. Now, that was true until we were attacked and our love objects were threatened. And when that happened, this nation was raised up and its fighting men were just as vicious as any fighting men can be until that whole system that was trying to destroy our love objects was annihilated. You see, if we hadn't done that, if we hadn't put together those great allied armies that went over there and destroyed the Third Reich, then there wouldn't be a Jew living today. And the Jews are God's chosen people. They're his love objects. He loves the Jewish people. And they were being systematically exterminated, systematically put to death. I think the Holocaust is just like Assyria, just like the Babylonians. It's the same kind of thing. There was a genocide going on where the people of God's future was concerned, and those people were God's love object. Now, God, I believe, during the 40s, crossed over, and he expressed his wrath until that system was annihilated. Now, that's an idea. I think that's a concept of what the book of Nahum is trying to present to us. That's the character of God. Sure, God is a loving God. Until the cup is full, until the unrighteousness, the injustice, the sin has become so great that he crosses over to this other side of his character and expresses his wrath. The book of Nahum shows us how annihilating it can be when he does that. It shows us how awesome it can be when God crosses over and expresses his wrath toward that which is destroying his love objects. And I believe as we come to the prophecy of Nahum, that's the thing upon which to focus. It's a real study of the character of God, showing us the composite attributes that make up the character of God. Not only the love of God, but also the wrath of God. You know, today's message makes me think of that worship song, Our God is an Awesome God. We saw that today, didn't we? God is not a buddy or a pal. Our God is awesome, completely worthy of our worship and obedience, love and respect. Well, it's been a special treat to have you along with us for today's Mini Bible College program. We so value your prayers for this ministry. Coming next time on the Mini Bible College, a new message from Pastor Dick Woodward. Goodbye for now, and may God bless you and keep you firmly in His loving hands.